This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Eldridge, welcome to Eldridge and Company. I wish Brad Lander, who represents the 39th Council District in Brooklyn, had been in the City Council when I was, because he brings a new style of politics that invigorates with its energy and hope. I'm proud that he's my guest today. Thank so, you so much. You're very welcome. So you represent a part of Brooklyn. It's got a lot of different neighborhoods. It really does. You, you did the list. <laughs> so it's the 39th District, and it follows the F train. It's uh, Cobble Hill, Carroll Gardens, uh, the center and south parts of Park Slope, Windsor Terrace. All those neighborhoods share some things in, in common. Then Kensington, which is a very diverse immigrant community, big Bangladeshi community, um, a lot of Orthodox Jews. And then I also represent a chunk of Borough Park, uh, <laughs> which is almost all Hasidic and, and ultra-Orthodox Jews. So it's a, it's a, a complex district. and wonderful district. It sounds almost like uh, Jackson Heights or something very like that. Very diverse, you know? it yeah. really is. Yeah. Nice. Um, I, I was reading your uh, web page and, and then your blogs and the schools. I mean, that sounds so overwhelming. Is that s the same all over the city, the shortage of space in schools? Um, there are places where it's even worse than in, in, in my district. And we really do have last year, there were uh, quite a few places where there were kids on the kindergarten wait list uh, in Park Slope, in Carroll Gardens, and Sunset Park. Sunset Park's even worse than Park Slope, although sometimes it doesn't get as much attention yeah. because it's immigrant community. Yeah, I don't know. Or uh, Corona, where my colleague Jalissa Ferraris is the council member, the most crowded schools in the city. Um, of course, it gets more attention when, you know, uh, Times reporters, yeah, kids right, can't get right. into the school. Right, that's how you got uh, an article. There's a deputy chancellor whose kids or yeah, my school no, almost didn't an, get in uh, And then it's the same thing year. in pre-K. Well, pre-K, we, we call it UPK, the U stands for universal. We should just stop kidding ourselves. We're not providing uh, pre-K to the vast majority of kids. Honestly, at this point, if we don't have enough resources to provide it to most kids, we probably should target it in low-income neighborhoods uh, because those kids don't have any other options. But yeah, and it's really two, a few different issues. Partly, there's neighborhoods where the population has boomed, either through immigration or through gentrification, and we haven't uh, built new schools. The school construction authority is actually trying to build a lot of new schools in my neighborhood to accommodate the crowding, but it's hard to do. You know, it takes Why a is while. It hard? Well, finding the land, you know, it's, we're a pretty built-out city, so I, mostly I, finding I, the why land. Why can't they, they take it? I mean, why can't they use that, that phrase? And, and, Eminent domain. Yes, and just decide that's where we're going to build a school. Right, and they, they do on some occasions. <laughs> is that and a they're terrible thing to, to say? Pay. Well, I, you know, the School Construction Authority is willing to pay, you know, market rate. So it's just finding those parcels that somebody's willing to sell a, a former yeah. factory building. So they're working hard at it. Unfortunately... In addition to the lack of space, the fact that each of the last couple of years we've had real severe budget cuts and there's essentially mm. been a hiring freeze in general education mm. means that the number of kids in classes has risen dramatically for because we don't have enough teachers either. And you know, you can quibble about whether there's a difference between, you know, twenty-three kids and twenty-five kids in a class, but the number of third graders who are in classes of thirty or more is up ten times from where it was two years ago. And nobody wants their third grader in a yeah. class of 30 or more. I mean, it matters having a good teacher, but a good teacher in a class of, you know, 30, 31, 32, yeah. 33 just still can't spend time yeah. with the kids in the way you can. So that combination of the budget cuts and the space shortage is really... I, I, really I, I, we could spend a whole half hour talking about education, so we'll move on. But I just wanted to say one thing. The, the pre-K and, and child care, is such, I mean, 50 years ago, they were doing the same thing. We were yeah. talk, talking about the same thing. And it's so essential. Absolutely. You know, lifetime. all the data. Exactly. You talk about being data-driven. Yeah. All the evidence that investments in early childhood education pay yeah. off and that if you don't invest in early childhood education, the, the life chances of those kids, even when they come to kindergarten, are already it's, so affected. Already we knew this with Head Start. New York City actually uh, had and still has 
the biggest program for providing child care to low-income working mm -hmm. families, not just on public mm -hmm. assistance, but low-income working families, but we've cut it by tens of thousands of slots. It's one of those things that's because it's not mandated. Every time the budget. We keep cutting yeah. it, and it's one of the most painful cuts. I hope, you know, I'd love to see the next mayor create a Department of Early Childhood mm -hmm. Education. Another problem is child care sits together with child welfare. Right. And, and that's terrible. a commissioner who goes to bed every night afraid, rightly, that a kid's right. going to be abused or killed right. so and not don't. focusing on child care. And so we have a little at DOE, a little at DYCD. We really need to bring together. We, you know, If you talk about the places where public dollars have very clear results in terms of how kids will do in terms of economic output, in terms of opportunities, um, it's really a place to invest. You come, let's, let's go on, because we have some bigger things to talk <laughs> about. Um, you come from a background that is uh, spectacular to be the background of somebody in the city council. I mean, right, you operated. Oh. Yeah, it's, uh, well, it's uh, spectacular, maybe it's well, a, no. little, uh, a little much, but I do have a, a, a planning, affordable housing, uh, and kind of community development background. I ran the Fifth Avenue Committee, which is one of the ones, city's so great big. community development, affordable housing organizations, tenant organizing, building affordable housing, fixing up old buildings, uh, doing workforce development, helping people get jobs in growing fields like cable installation and mm -hmm. truck driving. <laughs> uh, so I did that for a decade. Uh, built a few hundred units of affordable housing, a lot of other programs, and then for five years ran something called the Pratt Center for Community Development, founded by the wonderful Ron Schiffman, who was uh, on the City Planning Commission, a real leader in community development and affordable housing, but also connecting that with broader issues of city planning, of transportation, of more livable streets, of environmental and environmental justice, thinking about how growth works in the city and how we make uh, shared prosperity so that you know you have to have all the things a city needs from waste transfer stations to parks to schools how do you think about those in relationship to neighborhoods um, and that's not something that I feel like the the current administration generally focuses on they might think about where the waste treatment plant goes look down the future at what growth is going to mean for the city but really focusing on what that means in neighborhoods across the city that's sort of the background that I that I come from and it's it is great to bring to the council. Um, you know the importance of particip citizen participation, and it seems to me that's the basic thing for a lot of the things that you do. I really agree with that. It's been uh, <laughs> the most fun thing I've done in office so far. We can talk a little yeah. more about it. Is this participatory budgeting, where right. three other council members and I have opened up the budget process to direct democracy, uh, and uh, we can talk a little more about how that works. But I agree, it really comes from this perspective I have from Fifth Avenue Committee and my community development work, that when you open up, when you engage people in the process, when you take the time to educate and explain how it's working, and to give people a real say, mm -hmm. uh, not just a sort of phony say. Or but not just to tell them. <laughs> exactly. Um, people really step up, they're hungry. Look, they're hungry for a city that works, you know, it's true. You gotta pick up the garbage, you gotta clear the snow. You know, people want a functional city, but they do really want a say in what their neighborhoods look like. They want to be engaged in the process. And uh, and I've always found that to be true at Fifth Avenue Committee, at the mm -hmm. Pratt Center. And it is what inspired me in many ways. It's what government's supposed to be about. Exactly. Uh, there's no other job where, you know, you... And it's the basis of politics also, it or really it should is. be and the we, basis of politics. And we forget it. I mean, democracy yeah. at its best uh, yeah. is not just a one-time vote. It's real engagement. Uh, this participatory budgeting has been so interesting. It started 20 years ago in Brazil, in Porto Alegre, Brazil. A thousand cities around the world have done it, but almost no place in the United States. One alderman in Chicago started a couple of years ago, and then four of us are now doing it uh, in New York. Uh, council members Melissa Mark Viverito in East Manhattan, Harlem. East Harlem. Part of the West Side. Jumani yeah. Williams in East Flatbush in Brooklyn. Uh, Republican yeah. Eric Ulrich from Queens and the Rockways. It's a bipartisan <laughs> effort, uh, and me. Uh, we've each committed at least $1 million of uh, discretionary capital funding, uh, money that member com council members normally just decide where it goes for... It goes into your district, basically. Exactly, right? for parks, schools, streets. And look, normally council members make, you know, put it into parks, schools, and streets. Mm -hmm. This is not something anyone's putting in their pocket. This goes to pay for city infrastructure. Uh, but what we're doing is giving our constituents uh, the opportunity to decide where. And not just with a vote, they get to vote at the end of the day uh, and they'll rank order projects and we'll submit the projects exactly in the rank order. But it's even more participation than that. We started with a round of uh, neighborhood assemblies in October 
We had five in my district, 600 people came out, 1,000 people gave ideas. Across right. the city, you know, several thousand people came and said, you know what, the subway entrance on my corner, it's always flooding, it freezes, it's dangerous. Uh, here's where we need a security camera. My kid's school needs a science lab. Uh, some crazy ideas, the Gowanus <laughs> gondolas and the seltzer <laughs> fountains. But the ones that have really gotten support have been uh, both practical, really about the public realm, but also inspiring. Uh, the Bangladeshis that I mentioned in my yeah. district, they, um, w there's a, um, their struggle to preserve Bengali, their mother tongue, uh -huh. led them to uh, help create an international holiday called International Mother Tongue Day in February. And they'd like a monument that uh. sort of reflects <laughs> people's mother tongues in the park in Kensington, this very diverse neighborhood. So some real practical stuff like a subway that doesn't flood and leak and some inspiring well, things. Do you divide it up by the neighborhoods? Or? Well, we thought about that and actually what we decided to do is it's just gonna, it's gonna be rank ordered by the voting across the districts. And so the pot is a million dollars um, and we're hopeful that it spreads out throughout the district. There are a few things like those school science labs where we'll probably put two or three mm -hmm. schools together uh, but then there'll be a few things that, you know, are just one neighborhood or the other, uh, but we think it'll spread out. And, and this gets back to the sort of civic engagement or participation. One thing that I've been very pleasantly surprised by is, you know, people come out to these meetings in part because they have something that they want. They're dog owners and there's no dog run in their neighborhood and they want a dog run. But you can see the way it taps into this broader community spirit and people come out because they like the idea of working with their neighbors to improve the public realm right. in their community and I find the pull toward that more public uh, or community spirit uh, balances out the, the, the it's, pull which says that's so interesting in because that also then can expand and make some people understand or believe that their community they have their interests but they also to their interest this community should really prosper that That's we right. can't be the city that favors some places and not others or problems from other districts. Right? And it's really two That's parts. That's a civic engagement. Absolutely, and I, I think there's two things in what you said. First, you have to come to value and recognize other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You know, Brooklyn is wonderful, but mm -hmm. it is so segregated and so unequal. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm very pleased to represent some immigrant neighborhoods and some white mm -hmm. neighborhoods, but the you know more african-american and caribbean neighborhoods in central and eastern brooklyn so excluded from so much of the borough's prosperity so first how do we reach across those lines um, that's why i'm so happy that jumani williams yeah, and Melissa mark are yeah. doing it um, but you also have to believe that government is a vehicle for bringing people together to work toward that common right. good and, and understand your commonalities also not right. only your civic responsibility to hope that help those that don't have things but also how similar some of the problems are. That's right. And that's, that's been interesting great. to see, especially on city capital, you know, the subways are used by people across the spectrum. And mm -hmm. if, if the, you know, if you are nervous about slipping and falling, getting down to or from mm -hmm. the subway, that really brings people together across lines mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a public investment that's one of, you know, just makes the city work across the board. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about is the Progressive Caucus. You're, you've been in the council now for two years. That's right. I, I, I mean, it's my thought, but I haven't done big research, that you've done more in two years than a lot of people have done in 12 or more. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Is that I, because you were independent of a party organization, well, part of it? Well, a few things. I mean, you know, I, I came to the council. First, I think a lot. there's a lot of folks in the council who have right. gotten a lot right. of great things right. done, and right. I honor I know the work that. of a lot of my <laughs> colleagues. Um, uh, I really mean that. I mean, yeah, and, no, I, and one interesting thing is that you see in the council across the spectrum of, I mean, look, I'm a avowed progressive, a fight hard for living wage, for paid sick days, for the millionaire's tax, but I have found people in the council who totally don't share my ideology, who have a lot of integrity and are fighting hard for what they believe and for their neighborhoods. Not everybody, unfortunately, always has integrity in our body or anybody. We've had some indictments, and um, but... It's been interesting to find people who really view the world differently but still get a lot done uh, for their community, and that's been encouraging. But we had a few things going for us. First, we did, uh, in 2009, um, quite a few new folks came into the council, some of whom were, uh, I mean, in my case, the, the incumbent Bill de Blasio ran for and won mm -hmm. Office of Public Advocate, so the seat was open. Some people challenged incumbents, so Jamani Williams challenged mm -hmm. Kendall Stewart. Uh, so we had new people who came in. Uh, quite a few bringing sort of more of an organizer, ap uh, mm -hmm. activist, or advocacy background. 
uh, people who had worked together. Uh, Margaret Chin and I had done some work on affordable housing. So we, we already had something of a group. We shared uh, some allies. A lot of us had worked with uh, some of the labor unions, more progressive labor unions, community organizations, affordable housing groups. And the result of sort of sharing allies, and yes, of getting there without having maybe gone through some of the more traditional Ways political routes yeah. meant we have the ability to work together. And so not long after we came into office at the beginning of 2010, a dozen of us formed the Progressive Caucus. Uh, certainly there have been uh, stalwart progressives uh, like you and Ruth Messenger who have been real leaders in the council uh, and work together to organize people, but doing it in a formal way as a block with a caucus uh, has been great, and it's Good. given us the opportunity to push on some issues. We we just got a resolution passed calling for the repeal of Citizens United. <laughs> uh, we were some of the main advocates uh, for this living wage bill, which passed in a in a compromise form, but without the advocacy, I think it, it wouldn't have been thinkable mm -hmm. at all. Um, we were the most vocal on the need to extend the existing millionaire's tax. That was a state issue, but uh, again, Very something important. we pushed on. So uh, it's been fun. It's, it's challenging. You know, there's mm -hmm. different points of view ideologically in the council. The political realities are, uh, are always shifting and, and complex. But we, we've got a group of people who I think want to see this city be a more equal, a more fair, a more compassionate place, want to address these issues of racial and economic and, uh, inequality, which Look, we're talking more about these days than we were a year Absolutely. ago. A year ago at this time, you know, I didn't have that much hope for where a spark right. of progressive energy would come right. from. And it, but it seemed to have come from people who had, who had the experience of organizing and of neighborhood work and stuff. It's an interesting kind of, it's a gradual switch, but it's also uh, very much in line with Occupy Wall Street yep. and that, these movements of from the bottom up kind yep. of thing. Well, so, I, yeah, both things are, are true. We, there's a lot of us who have histories as organizers. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I worked mm -hmm. at the Fifth Avenue Committee, Jumani as a tenant organizer, Margaret Chin at Asian Americans for Equality, uh, Melissa Mark Viverito, mm -hmm. who's my co-chair, has got a union background. So there's no doubt that a lot of folks in the Progressive Caucus uh, share that more grassroots organizing mm -hmm. history, spirit, energy. But look, it's also true if you look at the poll numbers on Occupy Wall Street that <laughs> um, people with no history themselves of really getting out in the, in the doing streets it, or doing it? an organizing, much less, you know, sleeping out, uh, <laughs> have come to believe that income inequality, wealth inequality, the role of money in politics, the way financial institutions kind of got away with, uh, you know, uh, going into unregulated markets and driving the global economy off a cliff, that those are core issues that we weren't talking about. And whether your style to, to be talking about those is to go and right. sleep out in Zuccotti Park or to organize a campaign with other organized institutions or just to say, you know what, this isn't right. Um, you that's know, I what, think, I think that's a majority that's, of the city and the country know those right. things aren't right and want to do yeah. something about that's it. That's what's so important. This isn't right and I don't want it to happen again or I want to change it. That is such a... Um, in the women's movement, we talk about a click, or, you know, th that's the moment of consciousness when you realize. And so many people believe that, but then they think other people know more than they do. Right. So they're not going to voice their opinion. And look, they're hard problems. Yeah. I think it's, it's everybody, not everybody, the vast majority of people know that income inequality and wealth inequality in this country have reached a level where it's bad for us. It's mm -hmm. bad, you know, for the folks who don't have that much, but it's bad for us as a whole to have this deep a level of inequality. I think most people feel like the role of money in politics has gone way too far. Um, and I think most people recognize that the way financial institutions uh, in unregulated space kind of drove us into this global recession. Uh, so now, moving to solutions, saying, all right, so those are problems. Let's first build a big majority of people that say that's what we should be focusing on. Uh, you know, then getting to real solutions is, is how can harder. Can the city council have any effect on Wall Street? Well, uh, a little bit, I think, is the answer. I mean, you know, partly you have to galvanize these movements where you can. And so city councils, we, uh, on the Citizens United case, yeah. um, you know, I was glad that we would be where the, you know, right, Los Angeles City Council did it. Uh, we did it. We need Congress to do it. it. You yeah. know, I mean, we can't change yeah. the federal uh, the federal laws. Now, the city council did create New York City's campaign finance system, which mm -hmm. is a real model for how to have a campaign finance system 
that advantages people and not corporations, not big money, not mm -hmm. developers, not lobbyists. So um, having the model makes a difference and joining people to speak up makes a yeah. difference. Um, you know, there are some things we could do. I, one thing we've been looking a little at, I think the council working with the mayor, for example, could change it so that uh, private equity and hedge fund managers uh, had all their income treated like your income yep. and my income instead of a tax and, and at capital half gains that rate as and capital, capital gains. gains. Yeah. So you know we but can't you, change. Can you do that yourself? Or don't you have to go to the state? Uh, I think there's a question about Whether just on this narrow issue of what's called carried interest. Uh -huh. um, we have what a city is income it? tax. It's right. income. You right. know, so uh -huh. the income that that, that hedge fund and private equity managers earn is income. It should be taxed as income. It should be taxed as income at the federal level. It should be taxed as income at the state level. It should be taxed as income at the local level. It'd be better to do, um, mm -hmm. you know, across. Like it'd be better to do, if Connecticut and if Connecticut and New York got together to do it. Mm -hmm. Then you don't have this. Oh well, they'll just move to Greenwich right. and um, New Jersey. Yeah. So I don't know that they want to move to New Jersey, but uh, oh, but yes, Jersey that. too. I'm yeah. sorry, that's fair. Uh, it's you only know, the it's, governor. Uh, <laughs> A lot of nice people. Um, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and look, I think the, the this living wage issue also um, a very effective is, a, you know, a, a really important way of saying if we're going to put city subsidy into something, we're going to take our mm -hmm. tax dollars and incentivize job creation and growth, those jobs have got to pay a living wage. And uh, just getting it, you know, so I'm, I'm glad that we're going to be doing something there. I am disappointed that you know Target and McDonald's and companies like that uh, Don't will get still included. be allowed yeah. to pay their workers, you know, the the minimum wage in retail malls that we're subsidizing with your tax dollars and mine, because a lot of the money we're ta we're subsidizing goes to the malls, and it's fine to say, well, we should only cover the direct recipients, but the direct recipients are the people that like create the mall, and right. then they then offer go. space in these subsidized yeah. projects. To, but <laughs> even without this, so I, look, I wish we had that. I'll keep fighting yeah. for that to me in many ways. That and They was always the mention a stock thing. transfer tax, but that's... Stock that's, transfer tax is harder. Um, uh, I, go on. Partly, uh, I, uh, there was jurisdiction, you know, I think we would need mm -hmm. the state to do it. Partly, those technologies are so mobile now. It is. You know, some things are harder and easier to move. The Target and the McDonald's at a shopping mall <laughs> can't go to New Jersey or Connecticut if they want to sell you right. clothes or shoes or sneakers or food in New York City. So I see, they don't have an easy time sell the stock moving. from someplace else. Uh, buy it, so. Other things, you know, like Fresh Direct, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, they could look at moving to Jersey. That's a work for them. Uh, but you know the these stock transactions they're mostly done by computers and moving the computers turns out not to be that hard at all so I'm glad that we at least didn't lose entirely the millionaires tax the high income surcharge mm -hmm. uh, you know that's an area where I think we could do more this private equity that we manage well, you know there's a lot of quirks in our tax code we got a big tax uh -huh. abatement for people who own and park their cars in Manhattan, and with all due respect to, to Manhattanites. <laughs> Please, we uh, pay we so much, special, I'm always uh, object. Yeah, parking you know, tax, that was, I know uh, I have a abatement, pet peeve. But. People who live in the uh, other boroughs think the people who live in Manhattan are crazy. <laughs> and they must think we're very all very rich. Uh, we pay 50 cents for 10 minutes on a parking meter. You don't do that. No, that's it. true, it's true. I mean, we pay, and property taxes, above everything else That's so it's not well. it's hard anyway no, and i think you're right this gets back to what we were saying before what we mostly need to do is build you know uh, solidarity between yeah. communities yeah. so people recognize <laughs> collective problems you know we're not going right. to provide child care or uh unovercrowd our schools by the difference between you know yeah, the parking no, meter rates we or shouldn't, the parking definitely taxes. Not. so we've got to do that it's together. interesting to think do you think that uh, bloomberg would be reelected as mayor if he ran now with all the emphasis on on wealth it's, it's interesting, an interesting question. It? it really is. I mean, I, you know, some days I look at him and I wonder how much fun he's having. And I wonder if he really <laughs> wanted to, wanted the third term. Yeah. Um, and look, I, you know, I've been a critic of the Bloomberg administration when they've, you know, they've also done some things. Look, I think this applied sciences campus that they're it's bringing be great. is great. Uh, you know, and that's a big idea. Uh, same with Plan YC with the mm -hmm. sustainability initiatives. Those are both ideas that they've really led the way on. So. Uh, you know, I think that's great, but I also do agree uh, that these issues of equality, of inclusion, of participation, and of neighborhoods are what people want in so much of the city. And the different, you know, that we didn't talk about the stop and frisk numbers, yeah. but the fact that out in Brownsville or East New York, 
you're just overwhelmingly likely to be stopped if you're a young man of color. Uh, and, um, and in so many places, people want an attention to building more equality, more opportunity. I believe that a candidate who could balance, who can show both things, can say, you know what, it is possible to run the city well, to have good people leading those departments, to make sure government works, to take advantage of new technologies, to be thinking about the economy and its future like the applied sciences. But that can go hand in hand with attention to neighborhoods, with drawing people in and asking them to participate, and to aspiring to a more equal city that really offers opportunity to everyone. In my point of view, those things can go together, and I think a candidate that puts them together is one that New Yorkers want as their mayor. So are you going to run for mayor? <laughs> <laughs> that has to be the next logical question, doesn't so, it? So <laughs> in 2013, which is coming up, I'm going to run for re-election to the council, but about half the council, the seats are open. And so this we will be- This is another effect, isn't it, of term limits? It is. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. And we will be looking for candidates who, uh, who I think share our point of view, mm. who have a, you know, these core progressive values of inclusion, of equality, of neighborhoods, of affordability, uh, of good jobs. When you say uh, core progressive, you mean really an ideology, a spon an ideology that goes beyond just what local laws are, but with yeah, a goal. You know, with yes, a goal. absolutely. I mean, look, New York has a history, has a tradition of saying that we can bring people together, often comes through organizing, whether it's labor organizing, community okay. organizing, parent organizing. We bring people together, and when we do, government, uh, pushed by advocacy and communities, is a tool for a city that is more equal, that's more just, that's more fair, that really aspires to pull people up together, not this model that says, you know, some kind of Ron Paul model, it's very popular these days, or yeah. in different ways, Mitt Romney too. Um, you know, government is just out there to make sure people kind of don't kill each other and will let them go off and do their own thing, kind of be in their own corners, fight with each other, the strong will survive. That's a model, it's an ideology. New York City has <coughs> led the way uh, in saying, yeah, people are gonna g compete, they're gonna be creative ideas, we're gonna start businesses, but we're gonna work together to use, um, <coughs> to come together to use government to try to level the playing field, to try to make sure there's real equality of opportunity, to try to, pioneer and say that race or gender or class or immigrant background aren't what should be determining your life chances. So that's the core progressive okay, idea. That's we're a be good pushing. message to end this program. So thank you very much, Brand, and I hope we see you again. Soon. I look so forward to it. Thank Thanks you. For If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.